Hey, welcome everyone to the Summer Plot Tour. Uh, we have a great lineup today. Uh, so we're here out in Belleville and we're going to be looking at some mode of action trials and then get into some growth and development on corn and soybeans. Uh, Tell me who you are. Tell me who you are. <laughs> I am Rebecca Zach. I'm the crop production agent here in River Valley, and we have uh, Jay Wisby from Central District and Sandra Wick from Post Rock with us today too. And we have uh, Sarah Lancaster, the state weed specialist here, that's going to go over the uh, mode of action trial. So, if you, you, you want to jump in? Sure. Do we want to move the camera? Yeah. So we'll kind of, Rebecca, if you want to tell them. Sandra, as we go. Okay. Great. All right. So, good morning, folks. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we are going to talk through uh, some different herbicide modes of action and look at some of the symptomology associated with those different herbicide modes of action. So, uh, Rebecca and Scott here have for us. They planted um, in early May. They planted um, some corn. So the corn is actually um, the row furthest to the east. And then we have some extend soybeans, so some dicamba resistant soybeans. We have some enlist soybeans, so 2,4-D resistant soybeans. And then we have conventional soybeans. So we're going to look at some of the selectivity of these different herbicides, um, as well as some of the symptomology. The herbicides that we applied that we're going to go through include select, Extendamax, so a dicamba formulation, Enlist, so a 2,4-D formulation, Ally, Roundup, and Liberty. Okay, so six different herbicides. All right, let's walk through these plots. So I'm gonna gonna challenge our video crew here a little bit, probably as we we do this. So the first plot we're in, we have a full rate of select max and then a half rate of select max. So we use 12 ounces as our full rate. The big thing to observe here with select as far as the selectivity, um, select is, is the trade name for a clethodim product. Clethodim is a group one herbicide that works by inhibiting AC, that is an ACCase inhibiting herbicide. So it it works on an enzyme that is only uh, found, the active form of that enzyme is only found in grasses, okay? So the takeaway here is that these group one products, um, like Select or Shore is another example of these products, they're effective only on grasses, okay? Some of the things uh, we're going to look for, um, the key tell here, ACCase is involved with um, making fatty acids that are important for building cell walls. And so one of the things you see yeah. is that the cell walls don't form in that new growth. So the whorl of the grass plant is really easy to pull out of those, those treated or affected plants. Okay. Oftentimes before you get to this stage of injury, you'll see kind of that general Okay, so that's the last. Mangrove regulating herbicides, particularly 240 and dicamba, have limited impact on grasses. We primarily think of these products as um, targeting control of broadleaf weeds. Okay, and so symptomology that we generally look for with these products um, include things like uh, cupping of the leaves. Or, so basically, here is an example of a leaf that would be somewhat cut. I don't, I'm not sure what this looks like on the camera, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get up real close. Okay, so this leaf, you can see the edges are kind of curled in. 
Um, we also think about, you know, sometimes at very low rates, we see kind of wrinkling or bubbling on the leaves. Um, we also talk about changes in the way the veins form. So um, strapping of the leaves, so they, they grow straight. Uh, the veins grow straight instead of uh, netted like you normally think of with the broad leaf. So some things to notice about this plot. Obviously the conventional soybeans did not withstand the application of the hammer. We have our extend soybeans that are um, growing well. And then we have our, um, uh, our soybeans back here. Okay. Uh, uh. I think I just said all of that backwards. Oh. So these are the enlist soybeans. And these are the extend soybeans. And this <laughs> was, um, this plot right here would have been sprayed with 240. Okay, I'm sorry, I was reading my map backwards. So, but still, we have the same pattern here. We have the um, conventional soybeans that were um, controlled with both the 240 and the um, dicamba. The herbicide resistant varieties were not affected and the non-herbicide resistant varieties were very negatively affected. Now one of the things I wanted to look at that I thought was interesting when I came in was checking these pots earlier. So these are the enlist soybeans that were treated with dicamba. The severity of the injury on these soybeans is much greater than we saw over here on the extend soybeans that were treated with enlist. So I wanted to point that out today as we think about stewardship of some of these herbicide resistant traits in soybeans. We know that soybeans are much more sensitive to dicamba than they are for 2,4-D. And I just wanted to take advantage of that opportunity to point that out as we think about the importance of on-target herbicide applications here um, as we go through soybean production season. Okay, let's step down to the next herbicide. The next product on our list is Ally. Ally is a Greek 2 herbicide. And those herbicides work by stopping the production of an enzyme that we call ALS. The short name is ALS. It's important for making amino acids in the plants. And so one of the things we kind of talk about with these amino acid inhibiting products is that basically the plant just kind of starves to death. Um, it takes a long time for these products to work and for the, the amino acid production to kind of, the lack of amino acid production to catch up with the plant. So some of the common symptoms that we look for are with ALS inhibiting products. On the soybeans, we're going to look for yellowing. I'm getting too close, Sandra, aren't I? <laughs> yellowing of the growing point. Yellowing of that growing point. And these beans were pretty small when they were sprayed. So we don't see a lot of that characteristic reddening of the veins. Um, that we often see with these ALS inhibiting products and they affect soybeans and end Okay, here, this one kind of shows it a little bit. Back here in the corn, what we see is, again, that general sclerosis um, of the growing point. So that plant stops growing, the growing point starts to turn yellow, and we have some reddening of the veins here in our corn. Okay. So I wanted to include Ally in this um, lineup as our ALS inhibiting herbicide because it's one that we, we talk about a lot for wheat production and green sorghum production. So it's one that, that we might need to think about and be aware of. So that is an ALS inhibiting product. If we had wheat in these plots, we would see quite a bit of variation in terms of the wheat species that Ally would control if we compared that against another ALS inhibiting herbicide. One of the reasons that ALS inhibiting herbicides were so popular when they were first developed and commercialized is because they allow us to control 
weeds that are very similar to the crops. So they're very specific in terms of the weeds that they will each product will control. All right, moving on to the last two products that we have. We have we have Roundup and Liberty. Okay. So that one of the things to remember about Roundup and Liberty is that these were really the first two products that we had large scale use of herbicide resistant corn and soybeans for. Okay. So we've got very healthy corn and soybeans. Um, and then our conventional soybeans are completely dead. So as we think about what we might see for symptomology on weeds with these particular products, Roundup is another herbicide that stops amino acid production. So when you have a plant that is affected by Roundup, it also is going to stop growing and then that terminal is going to turn yellow and then eventually that plant will die. So it's very slow acting, takes 10 days, two weeks um, for full effect. Liberty is also a non-selective herbicide like Roundup. So that means unless your plant has that gene to make it tolerant to the herbicide application, in general, it's going to kill whatever plant it comes in contact with. But Liberty acts differently. Liberty is a contact herbicide. Um, it tends to, um, injury tends to start with kind of necrotic lesions, and then we see that spread into yellowing and, and plant death. It's going to act much faster than glyphosate. But one of the things to remember about Liberty is that because it doesn't move around the plant, it's a contact herbicide, that means when we apply Liberty, spray coverage is very important. Um, so making sure you have the proper nozzles to get a relatively small droplet size and making sure that you're using the proper spray volume. So we're looking for a minimum of 15 BPA with products like Liberty. Um, you know, really 20 is even better. I um, mean, it is the rest. So those are the products that we applied out here. And I'm looking at the symptoms that we observe in these um, four different products. So thanks, you guys, for tuning in and listening. And we're going to toss it back to Rebecca. Thanks, Sarah, for going through that. Uh, so next up, we'll kind of go through the plot and tell you what's happening and then jump into some growth and development. All right. Alright, so after the mode of action trial, we have uh, different planting dates. So for this corn, uh, you can see we got three different growths here. Uh, the early one was planted April 27th, the next was May 7th, and this one was just planted. Uh, <laughs> Uh, coming up with the date uh, a week or a few weeks ago. Okay. Uh, so then next we have the repeated but just on beans. So April 27th, May 7th, and the same date a week or so ago. All right. And next up we have, uh, uh, so we pinched off the apical bud of the soybeans. So we're going to look for that. Uh, growth responds with how it'll jump back. Uh, so it'll tend to bush out a little bit more. And I know uh, Sandra's going to go over a little bit more, but we pinched off the top about um, five days ago. So it is starting to bounce back, and you'll notice some of them. Uh, it's now starting to split off at each of those nodes and have a new growing point. All right, uh, next. 
uh, we have our blackout trials. So uh, this side of the row and behind uh, was sprayed completely solid black with black paint five days ago. And as you can see, it's grown quite a bit since. And this row right here was sprayed a day, a day ago. So those new trifoliates are opening up. So this is just to show how much crops are actually growing at that time. So if you take into consideration how much then your weeds are growing too at that same rate. So making sure that if you are waiting a day or so to get into the field to spray, plants are growing at that rapid pace. So be aware of that. So we did the same thing here on the corn. It was sprayed solid black five days ago. And as you can see, uh, it's grown out of it quite a bit. Even uh, it's growing throughout it to pushing those leaves out to get more area. Um, and then these guys were sprayed uh, a day ago. So that whirl is still putting out new leaves and pushing out the old leaves to continue growing. All right. Uh, if we move back here, we have some weeds that were actually sprayed with black paint and you can see how they're growing out too. <laughs> All right. So this velvet leaf was sprayed five days ago, solid black, and it has three big new leaves and two little ones coming on there. But even down the whole plant at each of those nodes, same like soybeans, uh, you have new little leaves coming in there too. Uh, and this one, that's the same thing, but this one was sprayed a day ago. All right, and you can still see that new leaf, how much it's grown since. Just in one day, put out new leaf there. Um, got some pigweeds that are also sprayed black five days ago and how much they're putting on and growing out all at the same time. Uh, all right, uh, with that, we'll jump into some corn. I'll come over here. Okay. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jay Wisby. I'm from the Central Kansas District and today I'm going over the corn growth and development. Um, I guess before we go over that we ought to think about why is this important? I mean, what does this matter to us? Um, knowing the growth of your plant has a lot to do with um, what stage of physiological growth pattern it's in and, and when you can spray herbicides is um, sometimes uh, put on label as to you need to spray it before V6 for instance and, and you need to know what V6 is if that's gonna uh, because that matters okay to start off we have you put the seed in the ground it'll um, takes in moisture and oxygen uh, about 35 percent moisture it will uh, start to elongate it'll have a mesocotyl that'll cover, cover up the coleoptile when that coleopto touches the surface of the earth, it's VE, that would be emergence. Um, you'll have little seedling roots that'll start to um, establish right there from the seed. And on this plant, we are, um, I'll get into that here a little bit, but you can see the seedling roots here coming off as well. Um, the first true leaf is actually rounded edge. You can see this is actually a V2 corn, but uh, it, the first true leaf is rounded edges. And you'll know that's the first. And then after that, the next leaf is uh, denoted by the collars that are showing. The collar is the base of the leaf where it meets up with the um, um, stalk of the plant. So if the collars are emerged, you can see that. So this plant is a V2, one, two showing. The third one is not is still down in the sheet. So, um, significance of V2 corn is um, the plant will start to have nodal roots develop. It should reach out, hopefully reach your starter fertilizer and become taking up nutrients. 
from our different planting day plots. We, I pulled several different plants here. And the first leaves become difficult to see over time. Uh, this plant, oh, a few weeks older is V1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is V5 corn. So it doesn't take, as you can see, the growth di discrepancy between the V2 and V5 is significant on these. As we get further along in development, we'll have the, the first true leaf will start to fall off. So it becomes a little harder to see, but um, find the first one, two, three, four, five, six. This is V6 corn here. Much more nodal development. Um, some of the significance of V6 corn is um, somewhere between V6 and V10, the amount of uh, kernels in the ear starts to develop, and also the growing point becomes uh, right at the surface of the earth. Um, why is that significant? Before V6, the growing point is protected by the ground. So if you were to get a hailstorm prior to this stage, it would not have so much adverse effects. It should be able to come out of it. It's pretty well protected. At this point, if it was to get a little taller and green snap, break off at the surface, your corn plant would be terminated. It'd be gone. It'd be done. So um, that's significant. As well as some herbicides, you need to be watching out. You got to read the label as far as that's concerned as well. Um, from the nutrient standpoint, because this is when you're going to start establishing ear development kernels around, you know, the girth of the ear. Um, we need to make sure our nutrients are on in the soil, okay, in so where the roots can get that prior to this stage, and um, so that they are uptaking what they need. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Rebecca was nice enough to okay. pull one of these and, okay. and show just the growing point. Uh, she stripped off all the leaves and showed the growing point of this corn plant. And as you can see, it would just be uh, getting above the soil surface right there. You okay. can see the tip there. Okay. And it all these this growing point, all the growth of this plant which is now, what, 18 inches tall or something like that, is still right here at the base of the plant. I went into some fields down south and started finding as large a corn as I could find today. Um, and this corn was planted in mid-April before it got cold, actually. And we have here V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. V9 corn. At, at this stage, we're going to have... A lot of brace roots. Um, most of the nutrients will be coming from these sorry, um, nodal roots. All these nodal roots will be where the nutrients come from on this corn plant. Uh, it will be starting to reach uh, very fast growth at this stage. It'll, yeah, this corn is just about ready to take off. Um, you could see by our spraying deal uh, that. It actually grows from each leaf, and it's amazing how quick corn happens. If, if we were to spray this corn here, uh, that that change would happen daily, not just over five days. It would be it, it's extremely rapid. Moving on, uh, we don't have any V14, for instance, but uh, V14, the significance of that, uh, you'd start to see, you'd be about two weeks from tassel. The plant would be well taller than me. Uh, yeah, most of the leaves would be direct at, at as the tassel reaches through the last, that's VT, um, the tassel stage. After that, we'd go into, when I say V, it's, it's vegetative stage is what this all means. Um, then we move on to R1, which would be silking. So the plant would be developing in here, and the silks would start to emerge. Uh, at that point, we're using a lot of moisture. Irrigation is very important. At V14, it's very important from just the heat standpoint so that we are not stressed, overly stressed as far as pollination is concerned. So at this critical stage is weather dependent. I know we can't change the weather, but um, that's sometimes timing of planting will have an effect on when you hit that hot spell. Um, so yeah, moving back to v tassel, silking. Um, about two weeks later, you'll have blister stage and that's where you can start to see the actual kernel develop on the ear there'll be a little bit of moisture in them there'll be a clear liquid that's a blister stage you should be able to tell that they have actually that the pollen has gone down through the silks and it has actually fertilized to that um, ovule so r3 is our milk stage uh, just that kernel is getting milky 
R4 would be dough. The, the starch would be accumulating in that uh, kernel and you'd have the dough stage there at R4. That occurs about 26 to 30 days after R1. So um, yeah, about three weeks after it uh, tasseled out, three to four weeks. At R5, you'd reach dent stage. That is indicated by the, um, the kernel is mainly, I, I don't have any gears here to show you uh, dent corn here, but um, where it's dented in the end. And R6 is be physiological maturity, it's black layer when that plant is uh, about 35% moisture content at that point and it will no longer uh, intake any more nutrients or water. Uh, so at that point, all your yield is completely established. Um, thinking back of what determines yield, we, we got ears per acre, kernels per ear, and then weight per kernel. So all those different things are major factors to determining yield. Um, some genetics has a big play as to how many, it's not just environment, sometimes it's, um, it's genetics plays a role in how many ears or, or kernels around the ear it can be, and also just the kernel depths in their overseed um, depth as well. So um, I think that about covers crop growth and development here. I've, I pulled up the, uh, I didn't really talk about the brace roots much. I, I found an old um, some residue here and you can see the brace roots formed later on here in the year. Anyway, we'll move on to Sandra, and she's going to go ahead and talk about soybean growth and development. There you go. We're going to see if these mics are working. So, I hit the button again. So, um, I don't know if it works or not, but anyway, my, um, my, my name is Sandra Wick. I'm the crop production agent with the uh, Post Rock Extension District, and we're certainly glad that you joined us out here on Facebook. I know that you guys are busy in the fields right now trying to catch up on your planting. So we uh, hope that you join us, and if you want to join, if you're joining us later and watching this afterwards, that's great too, because we want to um, help you with your uh, cropping enterprises. So I'm gonna uh, touch base real quick with the soybean growth and development. So I know there's lots of soybeans out there too. And as Rebecca told you, we have some different planting dates here. We have the information if you want to get these handouts, they will be posted on the Central Kansas, on the Post Rock and the River Valley, on the different planting dates. So I pulled some plants up here, and we do have my growth development chart, and we'll put this up. Oh, and by the way, these growth development charts are available from K-State Research and Extension free of charge. So uh, go to any of the extension offices and you can get that. And it's great if you can even hang them up in your shop or whatever so they're really handy for you as well to use. So we've pulled some plants here too. Um, and it may be hard to kind of see here, but maybe you can see the pictures too. But kind of with the corn, it starts out, you have your, your true leaves on the bottom, you have your cotyledons. The cotyledons will drop off eventually, and then you'll get the trifoliate. Um, and there's two different stages here. The V stage that we talk about, that's a vegetative stage. And then the R stage, which is the reproductive or when it starts developing that seed in that kernel. So the cotyledons are first and that's known as VC, okay? Um, all these technical terms, but as long as you know that they're the cotyledons, um, and then you'll know that. Um, with soybeans, these leaves figurations are a little bit different than corn that uh, Jay talked about. These are trifoliate. So each leaf coming in is a trifoliate. It's not considered the next stage until that leaf unfolds. So you can see that there are some other trifoliates starting here as well, but they're not unfolded yet, so you don't count that. So it's still one and two. Um, and it can go through as many as up to V6 before it flowers. When it starts flowering, and then you know that you're in the reproductive stage of that soybean. Okay, we're going to go to the next one here, and you can see that we have some more trifoliates, and as Rebecca mentioned, we have some black paint that we painted here, so you know how much it grew out. This was five days ago that we sprayed this black paint, and you can see that it has gotten two more trifoliates on here, and there's your two trifoliates, and then you have another one coming before it's going to start flowering. So it may get up to V6 before it's going to start flowering and putting that pot on there. Now, what's different than this than on the corn? The big, big difference. Mother Nature sometimes gives us some hard water or some hail, right? Okay, what happens 
when soybeans get hailed and there's nothing there, I'm just going to break this off. There's nothing there but this left. Okay, all you have is your cotyledons. That growing point is going with that plant. Um, Jay will show you too because he had a growing point down here. Maybe he may have showed you that too, but that's at the very bottom of that stalk. So that plant, although it's going to be really, really late on corn, if, it, if all those leaves get hailed out, that growing point is still down there on the bottom. So the corn could come back, okay? But it's going to be really, really late, as you can see, because it's going to take a while for all these leaves to go and develop, okay? Whereas the soybeans, if this top part is done, the growing point is gone. If there's no leaves on here, okay, we're going to just pick those leaves off. That plant is done, and the soybeans cannot come back because that growing point follows that up the stem, okay? Whereas the corn does not. So that's really important. I know we've had some places already that have been hailed out. You may have to go to your fields and determine, do you have 30% stand left? Do you have 50% stand left? And what are you going to do with that stand, okay? That's, that's a really challenging um, uh, decision on what you have to make at that point. Um, because these plants, yes, they're very uh, residual or they're very, you know, they want to survive too, but if they don't have that growing point, then that's not going to come back and survive. Okay, the last development of stage here in this particular field that we have, here's your cotyledons drop off, here's your first true leaves, and then you have one, two. So that would be V2 because you have two five trifoliates. Here's another one coming that would be V3 when that unfolds, okay? Now, if you keep going, the most important time on this vegetative stage is in the, in, the, in the vegetative stage, that root growth keeps going through actually R5. So the more root growth you have, the better because that's gonna get the nutrients, the water, everything that that plant needs as well. Now, also on these plants, what we call, and you probably can't see this, is nodulation on these soybean plants. And if you don't know what nodulation is, if you pull these plants up, it's those little irregular bumps that are on the roots, okay? That is its own nitrogen fixation for this plant. We have some really good nodulation on these plants, so that's a good sign. So Scott, the agronomist here, must have been doing something right. Or these plants, or this variety is really good because it's putting out some good nodulate, uh, nodulation. So you have to put some inoculant on those seeds in order for that to happen. If you've never been in soybeans before, if it's been a few years since you've been in soybeans, you may want to also double inoculate those. I have heard of that too, just to make sure, because if this plant doesn't get uh, um, good inoculation or nodulation, then the rest of the plant is not going to develop as well because it needs to have that nitrogen to fix that. Okay, so that's very, very important. Okay, so also at that same time, your phosphorus and your potassium are also uptaking those roots as well. So most of the nutrients are taken up by that reproductive stage six. And this chart, and I know it's hard to see this R, R6 on here, but that R6 is like a full seed is, is where you have the pods and the seeds going on. But the most critical time is R4, the reproductive four stage, because that's the critical, critical development as, as well uh, in terms of bean development in that pod. If you remember what happened last year, these beans looked tremendous, like in April and May, and even in the middle of June. And what happened after that? Mother Nature shut off the water, and it was so sad because those beans just literally were drying up. And that's the most critical time for those soybean plants. And maybe in other parts of the state, they got the moisture out here in north central Kansas. Those fields literally dried up. And that was that was really, really sad. But that, the R4, which the R4, if you look in here, that's the full pod. That's where it's very critical that there's no stress on that plant. That includes moisture, that includes hail, um, that includes high temperatures, that includes no nutrient deficiencies. So that's really, really critical that you don't have that stress. Well, we can't control that stress, can we? So um, we're very dependent on Mother Nature. But that's the critical time. 
stages four up to uh, reproductive 6.5 can also have some yield reduction problems or if it's that same stress it's not as critical during that time as between right at r4 okay it can have that same stress later but by that time your yield is already determined and, and what happens then and then you would have the young young pods come on um when you go on into r7 that's beginning of maturity and then you go on out in full maturity and that would be um r8 so again these charts are really really helpful so and, and we want to thank our sponsors too uh, which would be the kansas soybean commission and the checkoff and k-state research and extension so it's very very good to get these charts too okay um let's see what else do we have oh our next session coming up uh, did you want to come and say something Jay, yeah i'm just thinking okay. <clears throat> there uh, just one other thing i forgot to mention i guess corn is dependent based on heat units and temperature right so a corn plant that's planted here the first of june is going to jump out of the ground because it's got 70 degree weather and it could be this tall in in, in a much shorter stage of or, earlier stage of development than something that was planted early April that was really has lots of uh, leaves already erect and that matters because of um, the stage of growth it is and, and when it comes to timing of herbicides. Um, beans on the other hand are daylight actually nightlight sensitive so they they actually have the um, they trigger their reproductive stages based on night length and and that's it, it makes them entirely different and indeterminate and very unique in that aspect I guess but also that's really all I forgot to mention when okay. I was talking. So thank okay. <laughs> all righty. Uh, if you have any further questions or additional questions, once you listen to uh, th th this presentation, contact either Jay or I or Rebecca, and we'll be glad to get that question answered. We want to thank Sarah for coming out as well and giving us some information on herbicides. Our next session would be on Tuesday, July 13th, starting at 8.30 in the morning as well. Um, and we'll have Rebecca come here and tell you the um, topics that you're going to cover at, at our next one. Yeah, so uh, at the next one, we plan on covering uh, some disease aspects and fungiciding at that time. And uh, we'll also have, uh, that'll be with uh, Rodrigo. And then we will also have Jeff Whitworth out here talking about insects and the kind of pressures we're seeing there. So. Hope you guys can make it out. Uh, yep. Okay. Thanks for coming.